think it works. Okay, here we go. Okay, very good. So I think as you see all those kind of projects, I think it's, this is sort of like a set up the background about like how we actually try to understand this, you know, the, the whole process of the evolution of the China's development cooperation and also what, what, what kind of goal is try to achieve. Um, yeah, I think as you see the list, I like, you know, uh, the partnership for the global infrastructure industrialization, which was the most recent, you know, uh, efforts uh, launched by the G7, which I think it was trying to, you know, provides, you know, uh, well, they call it uh, the provides alternative, you know, uh, uh, programs uh, uh, with us, you know, the BRI. So I think China always faced this kind of like, a, you know, the, uh, the dilemma, I think, is when it's actually provided this try to um, engage in this international development uh, assistance. I think it's, you know, there increasingly you see the China actually facing these two pressures, you know, very different type of pressures, you know, they have facing this kind of like a international pressure, which I think it's the uh, other countries would want it to China as a, you know, a, in a way to becoming a great powers, it should actually uh, uh, assume, you know, uh, more responsibilities and provides more aids to the developing countries. But on the other hand, you see there's a increasingly, um, you know, the voice from this, you know, domestic uh, audience. They also, I think there's a lot of people in China don't understand why China was actually engaging so much of this, you know, the uh, aid and the behaviors, uh, you know, activities. You know, the general argument is China is still a developing country, and there's a lot of uh, low income population. Well, 66 million, I think, by the latest, uh, you know, statistics, which is almost the same, the whole size, the population of the UK. So I think this is kind of like, a, you know, you're facing those uh, pressures. I think I got a, a steal the term so from, you know, Professor uh, uh, Tukovitz and uh, yesterday, and he said, this is actually really a dilemma. Like, uh, and you if you do, damn if you don't. So it's it's kind of like a, you know whatever you choose is actually going to be very difficult uh, decision. So this is what China actually faced. You know when they were trying to uh, uh, reform its uh, you know the, the the aid system. So what I would say that I think it's you know the China's uh, aid system you know, over the last 10 years has experienced this, you know, transformation from three uh, aspects, you know, which I would actually just uh, uh, explain, I think is in details. One is actually have the institutional change, which I think it's the creates a central organization, you know, uh, the uh, organization which has the central coordination of the aid policy implementation, um, and two, it's the actually has also changed this narratives about AIDS, which I think it's moved from this development assistance to development cooperation, which is a broader concept. And the three, they also actually laid out a grand strategy, which I think is uh, uh, to outline a framework, which is to align China's, you know, the uh, development cooperation with this, you know, the, uh, you know, UN SDGs. So those are, Three things I would actually explain. Uh, first, uh, see this. Uh, the first thing I think is that maybe I think it's just could you move out the, the the the. I think is then they can see the title. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I think that's you know the first is institutional change. Uh, that happened I think is you know uh, 2018 when China has created China International Development uh, uh, Corporation uh, Administration SITCA you know, uh, which actually has become a, you know, a vice ministerial uh, agency, which was designed to address this coordination uh, and the priority issues. So this was actually, now we finally has a, a China's uh, uh, DIFI or, you know, China's uh, USAID, well, kind of like, a, you know, it was for the first time in, um, in history, right? So then also these uh, publicized this kind of new regulations try to cl uh, clarify this uh, framework of the China's aid programs and division of the responsibility among some major you know, government agencies. Uh, that included the three major organizations that the SICA, uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the uh, Ministry of Commerce, Mopka. 
So then basically you see the SICA was actually have the overall uh, responsibility for the foreign aid programs. Then the MOFCOM is responsible for this project implementation and MFA, which uh, foreign ministry is responsible for making recommendations on the, you know, to in line, to make this, you know, make sure that the foreign aid is in line with foreign policy objectives and for the on, on the ground liaison and to be the monitoring. So those are sort of like, you know, the institutional change. And then the second thing is actually, they have this sort of like a narrative change, which was started in, you know, China has been published, uh, has published uh, uh, three white papers on, you know, uh, foreign aid, uh, since uh, the first one is 20, uh, 2011, the second one 2014. Uh, now they have this, you know, 20, uh, uh, 21 was the third, they published this, the third paper. And the third paper actually has really made this kind of important, you know, significant change about how China actually define what is, you know, the development uh, cooperation. So this new narrative, well, basically, I think it's, you, can, you can read this, you know, documents, but the, the new narrative is basically trying to align China's with this, you know, a broader model of development cooperation, because the, the white paper, the previous two white paper is called China's foreign aid, right? But this one is actually development cooperation, which is using the broader concept while reconfirming China, China's position as the global South. So this is sort of like, you know, they're trying to serve, just as I said, you know, two different audience, right? So to the domestic audience, okay, you know, tell the, the, you know, the domestic public that China should take more global responsibilities as it's on the way to become a global power. So this is sort of like a, you know, uh, you know, message. And then another message is to the international audience. China will shoulder the international responsibilities, which is to align with this, you know, its development level and capacity. So it, China should not actually take too much responsibility, but, but the thing is we have to understand we are still developing countries. So this is what we, what we can do. So that's the second. And then the third one, which is, I think I call it a strategic change, which I think it's, you know, that was happens also uh, on, uh, in the same year, that's 2021. I think it's, you know, uh, you probably know that, you know, the Chinese pr uh, president, Xi has just announced that, you know, the global uh, development initiative, the GDI at the UN uh, general conference, uh, you know, uh, assembly. And uh, so, this one is basically it's uh, you know uh, China's this uh, you know grand uh, plan. Uh, sorry, I think it's grand plan for this you know which unified these various you know uh, development projects. I think this is kind of like a, this project. I mean, this uh, GDI so far is still kind of like a, a very uh, broad. Sometimes it's abstract, so you don't understand why is actually having this GDI. I think it's a uh, lots of people. Researchers to try to understand what does GDI really mean, right? What's what kind of impact it may have. So, I talked to uh, having those kind of like meetings with uh, uh, lots of the like policy practitioners. So that we were trying to understand. So some people actually uh, tell me, okay, if you want to understand what's GDI, you remember four numbers. That's the four numbers one, two, eight, one. So I don't understand what is eight, one, two, eight, one means. But here, here it goes. I think one, the first one which refers to the our overall objectives of the you know the development which is the, you know achieving this global community uh with shared future uh, that's the sort of like the, the 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 goal of this sort of like gdi two the number two, the 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 digit two is actually refers to that using two uh financial vehicles which is one is the global development and the south south corporation i think it's a the uh, the fund was launched, you know, uh, uh, a few years back, and the thing is, were uh, as a main vehicles that actually trying to, uh, you know, support the project related to this SDG. And another one is the China China UN Peace and Development Fund, another, uh, you know, fund which I think is uh, indicates that China is actually engaged more with this multilateral, you know, um, cooperation. Um, Eight, I think uh, the, the the third digit eight actually refers to this eight priority areas. I think as if you read this GDI documents, they listed all the eight areas, which I think is can 
you know, try to map, uh, you know, map, uh, you know, matching with all those, you know, uh, 17 of the, you know, SDG, uh, you know, um, development goals. So the, I don't have time to list all those kind of eight area, priority areas, basically, I think, including this poverty reduction, industrialization, and climate change, well, all those kind of, you know, the uh, uh, key areas, you know, uh, uh, listed in the SDGs. And then the last one actually refers to the uh, institution, which is the integrated in implementation system centered with a SIPCA. So that's so like, you know, how you actually understand this is so like in the whole GDI. They have this one goal, two financial vehicle, eight, uh, um, you know, priority areas, then let's have a one, you know, uh, centralized, you know, implementation system. So that's the, so like a, how we understand the GDI. Okay, so, but now how does this kind of like the whole, uh, you know, changes of this institutions, narratives and the strategic changes has affected, you know, the, the real implementation of this fund. This is something we are, I think people are more interested, right? How does this kind of, where does money go, right? How, how we get this money? And especially I think is when people are talking about this China's development finance. So there's a large number of the, you know, capital. So how does this kind of get really play into, how does this, the whole reforms affect this, you know, the the um, the distribution and uh, the, of this, you know, capital. Okay, here, I think we, we did a little bit like a, a digging on this China's official statistics. So this is actually all come from this, you know, the first we, we look at, you know, the China's official budgets on bilateral and the multilateral, you know, uh, channels of the eight. So we can actually see that, you know, um, uh, even though I think China has uh, made this kind of plan that's actually gonna expand this, you know, the uh, development aid, uh, but surprisingly, you see, I think is you know the the official budget on bilateral aid hasn't hasn't changed much since two thousand uh, you know uh, since uh, you know uh, two thousand uh, uh, you know uh, two thousand eight. So you see, I think the blue bar here indicates this bilateral aid, while the red bars indicates. It was represents this, you know, China's contribution to this multilateral in organizations. So we see this China's country. Well, but um, well, the bilateral aid hasn't much, hasn't changed much, you know, uh, over the last uh, few years. But the China's contribution to multilateral organizations has increased by nearly five times, you know, uh, during the during this period, which is kind of very. Uh, interesting phenomenon, right? Because you didn't see this bilateral aid budget changed, but then in the same time, you know, the multilateral, you know, contribution, uh, like uh, China's contribution to UN, to uh, World Bank, uh, that actually has changed a lot. A quick question. Mm. Is the decline from between 2019 and 2022 explained by the pandemic? Uh, well, you mean the multilateral, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think this is so like, you know, the uh, the contribution to this, you know, multilateral organizations include, I think it's a, you know, uh, membership fee China paid to those, you know, organizations and also some of the mandatory and the voluntary contributions. So I think it's the uh, po uh, possible explanations. It's actually the, because uh, this one is a come from this, you know, central, uh, the Ministry of the Finance, you know, um, uh, you know, their statistics. A, po a possible explanation is the overall level is doesn't it decline. It's actually where some of the, you know, the the fund which was previously come from the uh, Ministry of Finance that actually they have been transferred to other, you know, line ministries, so they could actually still provide this loans. But that's my guess. So I don't, I don't know. But I will find out. That's thanks for that question. Um, so then in terms of like, uh, who's actually be responsible for this, all this, you know, aid distribution. So I think that's, you know, if you look at this uh, bilateral level, the MOFCA, the Ministry of Commerce, are still dominant. So very surprising because you, you see this, you know, the SIGA was established in 2018, but it played a very minimal role in terms of like, uh, uh, you know, allocation of the aid. So, 
but most of the time they uh, contribute the you know like less than one percent of this aid bilateral aid. So the uh, Mofgan is predominantly player. So most of this you know bilateral aid uh, uh, spending was actually go through this uh, Mofgan. So that's the one thing we actually by looking at this uh, official statistics. And uh, secondly, we see that you know the on the multilateral aid dis uh, disbursement is kind of like a, become you know have a different players. You know, uh, here we have the list of I think it's the, the two main players are Ministry of Finance, which I think is a, they are be responsible for this China's you know contributions to the United uh, UN um, IMF um, World Bank, but there are also some. Uh, you know, uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs is also uh, a, a big player, actually, they are going to allocate this fund to some of the multilateral organizations. Uh, but here, I think it's, you see this kind of increase of this, you know, the uh, then the rest of those organizations, you know, they have played a very minimal role. I think it's including this MOF. MOFCON doesn't really engage much with this, you know, the uh, multilateral, uh, so was, you know, SICA. Uh, which I think is also have been very minimal in terms of like uh, their role of this, you know, uh, aid is, uh, you know, spending. Uh, but here is interesting. One interesting thing I think is you're probably going to ask, okay, what about China's own, so like a multilateral organization, such as, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the um, AIB, which I think China is the largest stakeholder and, the, you know, the, Udivon Bank, which I think also China has been one of the, uh, the, the founding members. Yes, I think it's part of this, you know, increase of the multilateral aid money actually goes to this, you know, newly created organizations. But it is, at the same time, we also see, I think China's, you know, shares of the, you know, the World Bank IMF has increased, which also means they have to pay more as their membership fee, which is part of, I think is a, a, in this normal, so, so like, you know, the uh, uh, estimates is most of the money will also be counted as, uh, you know, the aid. Okay, so, so far we are talking about the, all the aid money, but we know that, you know, if we are talking about the BRI or China's Divine Finance, it's more than aid, right? I think this is something just that we're trying to walk you through. Probably already know that, but I want to walk you through like uh, how this so like uh, you know chart how the different components of China's uh, development finance. Basically, I think is the aid bilateral and multilateral was come from this government budget. Then this is actually what we call this official development assistance. I think the people here are but probably quite familiar with that. So then you have the another part, which is the other official flows. Those are including some of the non-concessional loans, export credits. Uh, those are actually uh, primarily was, you know, uh, being uh, contributed by two policy banks. That's the China Export Imports, you know, a bank and the China Development Bank, CDB. So those two players, they actually play the lion's share in this development finance globally. I think that's, you know, uh, particularly this, you know, uh, China's Export Import Bank, I think has been the largest players. You know, I think as by one estimate, their total, you know, uh, loans was larger than what World Bank has been lending to, you know, all, uh, uh, its member countries. So I think those are big players you know, uh, other than this, you know, the age uh, finance. Okay. Uh, um, now, here actually, uh, it's difficult to actually to track all this development finance money, where, how, how large it is and how big, you know, where did they go? Uh, I think it's because there's no official statistics on that because we can, the best we can do is actually only look at the government uh, statistics to understand the aid money. But in terms of like the demand finance, we have to rely on some of the other sources. I think it's a A data, which I think is is a very popular source. I think they are tracked using this open, um, you know, source to track this all where this kind of China's demand projects go. So they have, this is their recent, uh, the most recent data shows that you know, um, between two. 20 and 20, uh, uh, 2000, 20, 21, So for more than two decades. So. China has, you know, accumulated over 
1.3 trillion of this, you know, demand finance. Uh, they gave this uh, demand finance to uh, the world uh, to uh, uh, to the world, most of developing countries. So, but in the same time, we see this uh, China's aid money, or, or what we call the ODA, or there's some vague kind of like a, you know, defense depends on the definition of the ODA. A in total, there are only about like a, uh, 130 uh, billion dollars for this last 20 year uh, 20 years. So that means you know the whole package of the bond finance is actually you have the one to you know only ten percent of those development finance come from this government aid. So ninety percent was actually uh, demand finance or loans. You know some of the ex export credits, which I think it were not be part of the ODA. So as a comparison. I think as we look at how OECD did, was doing, right? I think it's you know the same thing. The same thing is actually you know the there's a global trend that I think it's they have some blended you know uh, you know development finance that including both this you know aid and you know public and the private you know capitals. So this is how OECD was doing. You know they have this. This is actually coming from this OECD's you know official reports that between. 2012 to uh, 2020 and 2020, so OECD countries mobilized about $300 billion of the private capital as part of the demand finance. So this is compared with, you know, like $1.2 trillion of the ODA they provided during this uh, during the, the same period. So the, the private capital was only accounted less than a quarter of the whole demand finance. Now, the question comes, okay, China provided, I think, uh, you know, the whole package of demand finance, there's a 90% come from this, you know, the uh, loans or, you know, uh, the, the, the capitals from this, you know, policy, uh, policy banks or commercial banks. Well, in the OECD, they have, uh, despite all this kind of effort to mobilize this, you know, the uh, private funds, you know, they come very limited, you know, increase on this, you know, the uh, private capital uh, to, to supplement the ODA. So now the question is, how did China mobilize the resources for international development cooperation? So I think is I wanna just, this is actually be very bizarre questions. You know, how can you, you know, mobilize so much resources to do this? I think there, there has become a, you know, a very, Hot debates. Okay, how did China get this? How is that any of kind of like a, a, a secret plan those China was doing, trying to using this money to, um, for example, I think it's some of the dead trap, you know, argue, you know, claims that this is whether there's China is doing that. I think it's if you look at you know understand the China's political logic, there are something which I think it's you know. I will argue that China's approach of this international development cooperation is kind of like uh, the internationalization of its, its own development experience. Let me tell you why. Well, first, I think is if you go back to look at China's development experience, it's pretty much like a, it's a state supported. We call it state supported and the market based framework. So this this term actually comes from you know uh, 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 a a Peking University professor Chen Muyang. So she actually used this term to de describe this. So like uh, how China actually mobilized this. Uh, it's not directly state controlled, but the state actually using some of this. So like uh, uh, send a signal. Well, I think is the encourage. And more, you know, motivates this private, you know, all you know, different player, the privates or SOEs to try to get in, engaged in this game. So they were actually providing this sort of like a, you know, so the whole um, framework is just like China's own development, you know, framework. That is, you have the centralized, you know, political centralization, which has a kind of like a central government, but then at the local level, there is a very we call it economic decentralization. That is, they would give a lot of space for those local governments or for you know um, SOEs to try to to try to find their own way to engage in economic developments. 
So this is all like, you know, uh, we call this, a, you know, there's a terms for that as a fiscal, fiscal federalism or fiscal decentralization. Um, so a second uh, part about this, so like China's own development experience is actually, they have this launched this systematic policy experiments in various forms to try to resolve this uncertainty and facilitate learnings. So policy experiments, I think this is as many here knows that China has been always using this kind of uh, experiments, you know, starting from the 1970s, you know, when the very beginning of this, you know, uh, reform, you know, China's economic reforms using this, you know, special economic zones or all, all various types of like uh, experiments to try to test and find, you know, and adjust if there's uh, any uh, errors of this, you know, the uh, the experiments, then they kind of uh, so like uh, take it away. But then if there's, if turnouts be good, then they can actually put in a national, you know, uh, implementation. So that's so like a, a very typical Chinese way of the, so like they were doing things, uh, learning by doing, right? So they start to how actually to make this plan, uh, but then they only have very general guideline, but then they will encourage local governments to try to um, find the best way to implement those policies. So this actually leave a lot of space for those local governments and firms, SOEs, to compete, just try to find a way best, you know, strategy. So this actually applied to China's own development, right? I think is they were find a way to, you know, these local government officials basically behave like, uh, okay. you know, entrepreneurs. They try to find a, you know, their own uh, strategy to attract investments to uh, grow the economy. The same thing happens when they're actually doing this, you know, international expansion. So there are lots of like a, a provincial governments particularly like uh, Zhejiang or, you know, Hunan. So they're being very active to try to promote their own companies to go to Africa, to set up those industrial parks, to actually uh, engage in this kind of like, uh, in infrastructure developments in, in Africa. So those are so like the same strategy they're applying to when they actually do this international expansion. Uh, yeah, I think it's just give you a very quick uh, understand. I think it's, Yes, I think this the whole policy experiment, experimentation means there have to be a lot of like errors and uh, uh, you know trials, right? Because they could have a lot of mistakes that they made uh, on the on the on the way of the doing this policy ex experimentation. So this is actually come, you know, this is actually I borrowed this uh, uh, chart from the you know the recent article. I think is by two economists. You know, they, they actually look at you know how many. Uh, what's the percentage of the policy experiments uh, ended up fail, right? And they'll fail. And how how much? What's the percentage you actually actually become to roll out to the nation? So basic, I think, according to their findings, more than half of the policy experiments they failed. So they couldn't actually uh, prevail to become this, you know, so like uh, the real policy. So that just reflects what's the reality of China's development. So we know that there's a kind of like high growth uh, for more than three decades, but on the, on the way, it's a lot of failure, right? So they have experienced all those kind of investment fevers, or you have see this kind of like, uh, the, then, uh, then they have to, you know, the government have to, you know, rein to all those kind of like, uh, investment fevers, cancel a lot of like the development zones. So those things happened, you know, along, while the China was continued to develop. So this is kind of like a, what we see happened in China in, in its uh, path of development. The same thing, I think it's also happened is actually when China was trying to do its own international expansion. So lots of people out there talking about the, you know, their concerns, their concern about to the recent, you know, the very dramatic decline of China's, you know, development financing uh, last few years, right? Since uh, 20, uh, uh, 2016, right? I think 2017. So this two uh, charts shows that to China's development finance, there's a plummet, both in Africa and in Latin America. So, and the one of this, you know, uh, uh, concern is actually, they, they, they may never come back. So China gonna just, uh, 
scale down its you know BRI or maybe even try to you know um, uh, cancel it, right? But I think it's this is kind of like you know, if you understand the logic of China's own developments, it's pretty much like how they were doing things, you know, at home. Which is you see, I think it's the remember the BRI started twenty thirteen. For the last 10 years, it already experienced the three stage of like, uh, we call it recalibrating, right? So first they have started with uh, all those large scale infrastructure projects. Many of them failed, right? For sure. So they didn't work, you know? So they start to change that. All, also they realized that, you know, some of the infrastructure projects may uh, lead to some, you know, uh, controversy controvers on those kind of the impact on the environment, impact on this, you know, local community. So the second stage, they start to emphasize, okay, we have to need a green BRI, right? So that's the sort of like, you know, the adjustments. And I think it's, yes, I think it's for the last few years, you see this kind of a dramatic decline of this, the whole capital, but then they come up with the third Plan, which is okay. We're not going to uh, focus on this large scale infrastructure project. Now we're going to actually scale back, uh, temporarily. But now we emphasize the small yet smart project. I think you heard this term, right? So, so this is all like kind of like a, it's not a really surprising if you understand. I think is how the whole trajectory of the China's own development it always come back. You know, fluctuates. You know, between some of the you know you. You were stimulated the economy, then you try to cool down this economy. So I think this is the basically it's a, the same logic which, which you see this you know this international expansion. Okay, so uh, I think I have um, you know well there's another another uh, argument is actually okay as many people you know scholars would say okay China, Chinese finance you know uh, they tend to be uh, more patients. They're aimed for long term. They attempt to have a higher tolerance to risks. Yes, they do actually invest in countries, which I think is most of the you know the private investors don't go right. I think it's you know some of the you know um, conflict you know uh, countries in Africa or in, uh, Latin America. But are Chinese in, uh, you know investors are really kind of like uh, more risk tolerant. I think this is also debatable. I think this is not necessarily right. Uh, well, first of all, you see, I think it's a, a large chunk of those Chinese projects. So they do go to those infrastructure uh, projects, which is not, I think, is they can really tolerate the risk. It's, I think, indeed, it's, it's kind of like a China's competitive advantage in industrial capacity and uh, uh, infrastructure development. So they are, they're not actually really just because uh, they know this is our, uh, you know, a competitive, a competitive advantage. So they do have larger, disproportionately the larger shares on, you know, infrastructure and industrial developments. That's the that's one. Secondly, you see uh, the China, Chinese loans always come uh, aid or combines or, uh, you know, merged with the, you know, the loans, investments or trades. So this is all like the combination. I think it's you know uh, OECD or DAC uh, used to call this it's a tight age, which is quite a controversial. They said this is kind of actually was not a uh, so like a, you know um, uh, 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 you know the appropriate you know uh, policy, but I think it's I will argue I think this is so like a, this actually serve as a way of the, to mitigate the risk. You know if you actually want to have those kind of investments. Try to uh, motiv motivate private investors to go there. So you always start with this, some aid, and you know that actually could lower the upfront risk of this, you know, the investment. So that's also the strategy you see. I think is a, my very first slides showing that you know the the, the whole infrastructure project plans uh, launched by. G seven US UK also start to follow the same you know logic. And a, a last point is actually, uh, we do see, you know, uh, my own research actually shows that there is some historical aid legacy. China has given, gave those aids to those, you know, African countries in the past. 
they start they they have creates this kind of like a social capital which facilitate this contemporary investments and development finance. So those are also kind of like the, help them to reduce this you know the uh, the the investment risk to some extent. So those are so like some of the you know uh, questions uh, I would actually wanted to. Uh, uh, Clarify, maybe I think it's it's kind of like my own uh, take on this. It's not necessary. It's so like a reflects of any of that is opinion. But I think these are uh, something I I think it's that it's um, um, you know uh, you know uh, based on some of the uh, uh, you know the logic. Okay, uh, I think I'm already used about forty minutes. I have a few slides which I would actually. Uh, do a very quick just comparison about China's uh, development finance between the uh, chi development finance between China and those you know OECD DSC countries, uh, just to understand okay, despite all those you know different settings you know uh, methodology in this kind of like you know uh, um, giving or uh, structures institutions uh, difference, those two. Party at the China and OECD actually in terms when they actually comes to this you know distribution of this uh, demand finance it's surprisingly similar. Okay, I think it's there's some differences we can see. I think it's a uh, this one actually shows. I think this you know red one red and uh, this China this is OECD. We see I think it's um, before two uh, thousands. Uh, I think it's uh, two thousand eight. China was actually way smaller than OECD in terms of total demand finance. So we see there's a two parts of that. I think it's, uh, you know, there's a including uh, both this, you know, aid and other official flows, basically, basically it's loans. So uh, China actually, you see the aid part of this, you know, the demand finance is pretty much the same. You know, it doesn't it increase a bit, but I think it doesn't increase much. But the, the real, the increase comes from the demand finance part, which is the loans, um, which makes China uh, made China actually uh, surpassed OECD's total pack, you know number of the uh, uh, demand finance uh, by in uh, uh, 2008 2009. So after that, I think it's it's really kind of like in the comparable scales of the demand finance. You know, uh, uh, the China's demand finance is about like comparable with the the OECD uh, dark countries. Um, so this is uh, the the trend, and another one is actually want to show you. It's actually um, in terms of like uh, who gets the money, right? Because um, if we talk about aid, aid was supposed to serve this development purpose. That means you know they are supposed to give to countries that has the greater need of this capital. So low-income countries, those kind of like less developed countries are supposed to receive more aid. So if you follow this development logic, right? But if you follow this sort of like a commercial or business logic, so the money should go to countries that have a better business you know, prospects. So we see how we actually, so that's why we try to distinguish these two different type of the, you know, money, aids versus loans. So where get this, who get this money? So uh, we look at the uh, China's inf uh, data, I think it's, you know, it shows that uh, basically I think in, uh, a simple message is both China and uh, DSC, con uh, uh, DSC countries, they allocate their aid or ODA primarily to low and lower middle income countries. So that means the aid allocation still pretty much fit into this development logic that it goes to countries that are have the greater need for, for assistance. Um, then the next one is actually the other official flows, which is mostly are uh, you know uh, loans, non-concessional concessional no, no, loans or commercial loans. So they are predominantly goes to the middle income countries where you have the better 
business you know, uh, environments and uh, economic prospects. So this is true for China. This is also true for OECD countries. So this is actually, despite all the difference, differences between those two players in terms of like their, you know, logic, their, you know, um, institutions, agencies, but they have kind of like quite a similar distribution in terms of like how they actually allocate this, uh, you know, development finance. So, um, okay, let me just wrap up with this, you know, recap with the three uh, message I just presented. First is actually, um, uh, China's aid system, which I think is for the last 10 years, has been restructured through, you know, changes in the institutions, narrative, and strategy. So they have this kind of like a newly created institutions. They also have the narrative change through this, you know, new uh, white book. And they also have this kind of like, uh, the GDI as the sort of like uh, the grand strategy. And I think the second point is that I want to make is China's approach of development cooperation is pretty much resemble its own development experience, which is, you know, uh, emphasize all try and errors and uh, emphasize policy experiments and at, actually also encourage local governments, lo encourage the SOEs to try to find their best way to do this, you know, to, for this international expansion. And the last point is actually, uh, the allocation of the development finance, you know, between China and OECD DSC countries demonstrated some similar patterns, you know, aid, more money are more concentrated in those low income countries, while this other development, uh, development finance are more uh, correlated with the recipient countries' economic development, which is, I think, is largely goes to the middle income countries. So, uh, so this is all I wanted to say about this, so like the kind of like evolution of China's demand cooperation and also what does that mean and how does this affect us, you know, the allocation of this you know, funds. So I would appreciate any comments and questions. Thank you.